welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Here are your hosts, Julie Fudge-Smith and Colleen Pilar. Hi, welcome to Your Family Dog. I'm Julie Fudge-Smith and I'm here as usual with Colleen Pilar. And today we're going to do a couple of questions and answers. And the question I've been getting a lot since it's the first of the year and people are calling because they got puppies for Christmas or somebody came over and they realized that their two-year-old dog had no manners whatsoever or, gosh, you know, um, my nine-month-old growled at grandma and that wasn't good. So I'm getting a lot of questions this time of year about training. And a lot of the questions I get is, do I need a group class or do I need to do private lessons? And that is a really fair question to ask. Absolutely. And, and it may not always have a real simple solution. So, Colleen, what do you say? Let me give you a scenario. Somebody calls. We got a puppy for Christmas. He's 12 weeks old now. And is it too early to train the dog? And do I do private lessons or should I do a group class with this dog? Okay. Well, that one's one of the easier scenarios. So typically with puppies, when you can find a really good puppy class, mm -hmm. I love to get them in a group class. I like the the world of distraction and environment and variety that comes with a group class situation for a puppy to really help broaden their definition of what normal is. So for a puppy, in that particular case, I would say group class. But that's not always the answer. So I'm going to throw a scenario back at you that's a little a little more awkward. Okay. So I have um, an 18-month-old dog who is uncomfortable with unfamiliar men. He doesn't do anything really bad. He just, I can tell he's just like not comfortable and he's worried about them. Do you think I should do group class or private? Well... That's another very good question. And one thing I wanted to add to the puppy class thing is that for those of you here in Ohio, the Ohio State University puppy kindergarten is the best. That's where I take all of my dogs for puppy kindergarten. And then you go to puppy kindergarten. Then you come and take your beginning obedience class with me. So I just want to add that little plug in there for OSU and for me. So getting back to the... Let me, let me um, be geographically challenged here for a second. Okay. Okay. So... I have memories of driving from Virginia to Chicago as a child. And my memory is we go through state, 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 and then we're in Ohio <laughs> for a hundred years. Thanks, and then Kelly. we get to grandma's house in Chicago. So my question is, does OSU have one place that they offer puppy classes and is it centralized? That's a very good question. And what I, was I don't actually know where the Ohio State University is. I don't know. I'm going to plead ignorance right now. Well, I will tell you, you were somewhat near the Ohio State University when you were here for Midwestern Veterinary Conference. But the Ohio State University is located in Columbus, Ohio. And that's it's smack dab in the middle of Ohio. So if you are in the greater Columbus area, or even as far out as I am in Granville, um, which is about 30 miles east of Columbus, then that's a pretty central location. And they offer a wide variety of classes. Um, puppy classes, I mean, they have one like on, on Sunday evenings and Thursday afternoon. You know, they have different times during the week to try and accommodate people. Um, if you're in Cleveland, sorry, I'm not sure you're going to want to drive or Cincinnati, but you can look for good puppy classes there. But for those of you in central Ohio, OSU is pretty centrally located. So, okay. Good plan. All right. So, but back to our 18-month-old who is a little bit nervous, uncomfortable around, mm -hmm. around men. Um, well, you know, what I would recommend in that particular incident is if you could find, there's a couple of different ways you can go. Generally, group classes are less expensive than private training. So if budgetary issues are really a concern for you, what you might want to see if you can find is a shy dog class. Mm -hmm. So you're working specifically with other dogs that have these similar issues, and you're working with a trainer who knows how to handle shy dogs. 
So that would be one thing is to call a facility and ask if you have a shy dog class. So that would be one way to start. But oftentimes, what I find is that it just, a lot of it depends on the size of the class. So my classes are no more than six dogs. And so that makes it for a little bit smaller, a little bit easier. And while I don't run a shy dog class, I do have, I do build condos for them. So I have barriers or dividers. So if you're really shy, you can stand behind the barrier and catch your breath and feel a little bit better. And then maybe peek out, take a look at a person and go back in and get a treat. So if the person doesn't have a particular shy dog class, ask about the size of the classes and whether or not there's a way for your dog to get a break from people. Um, However, it could be, too, that private lessons would be something that would be really beneficial to this particular dog. And what I have found that works pretty well is that we will do one or two, I don't know, depends on the dog, maybe three private lessons when we're working on this particular issue. And then I invite them to come to one of my group classes where I know it's kind of small. So now we've had some experience. The owner has had some individual training, so she knows how to, he or she knows how to handle her dog around strangers. Then we put you into a group class that's relatively small, see how you do. That goes for six weeks, and then we follow up with a few more private lessons. So sometimes I find that the combination of private and group really does give you everything that you need to help your dog with. And and my goal with most of my private clients is to get them into a group class because Mm -hmm. what I really want them to do is your dog may behave really, really well when we're doing one-on-one at your home. But even if you don't go to a group class, my other goal is let's get out and about. Let's go to downtown Granville. Let's get out and take the show on the road so we can see how this works in public so I can work with you in public to help you manage this dog more effectively in public. But the idea of getting him into a group class means that my dog learns that even in the presence of other people and other dogs, I still need to pay attention to my owner. And that is really an important thing that's hard to learn in another situation. Yeah, that is, that's one of the biggest benefits of group classes, in my opinion, is that we can have this novel experience situation under a certain amount of control. Yes. So the trainer can decide how close another dog is to you or, you know, what's going on. Whereas sometimes with private lessons, when I would, I think like, let's practice something. And then uh, the bus drives by and I'm like, I can't control the bus. And I would love to have that bus go by one more time. No, let's four more times. I'd like to have that bus go by four more times so we could practice this skill. Yes. No, no, that doesn't happen that way. Whereas in a group class, whatever I'm setting up, I can either increase or decrease the intensity of to help the dog succeed. What you had said about doing a few private lessons before doing a group class is also really valuable because sometimes not only does it give the trainer a really good understanding of your dog's strengths and weaknesses, but it also kind of lays the groundwork so that in the group class, when everyone is working on the same skill, Mm -hmm. the trainer can provide really specific advice tailored to your dog based on a little bit of background knowledge. Right. And the other thing I find too, is that boosts the owner's confidence in class. Mm -hmm. Because the owner, we have worked on particular handling skills. So you know your dog, you know how to handle it. We've worked with this. We've talked about the, the right bait bag. We've got you all set up with the right equipment, the right everything. So that the owner comes into class a lot more confident and comfortable. And that makes a huge difference in the outcome for the dog. Right. So I find that to be, and then the other thing is, is what I found is, is that that way, not only are we talking about equipment, but it could be like, I was thinking about, she ended up becoming a very good friend of mine, but a client whose dog had some issues. But what we knew about Roxy was that if she could have her blanket draped over her back, then that helped to keep her calm. Mm -hmm. So we knew that. So Laura always came to class with Roxy and her blanket. So then Mm -hmm. if Roxy started to lose it, we could back into a corner, have her lay down, put her blanket over her, feed her some treats until Roxy was able to come back and join class. Now, 
how did we know that? We know that because I used to pet sit for Roxy, and we talked about these kinds of the things, but we'd also had a private lesson or two. So mm-hmm. that could work could be really advantageous because um, if you just if you have a shy dog or a dog that has some real issues and you bring it into group class, I can't just pay attention to you. I've got right. five other students, and if I don't know your particular dog, it's much harder for me to make those recommendations. And then you feel like, holy cow, I'm just sort of lost here. So um, I, I have found that that combination of privates and group classes can be very effective in solving particular behavioral problems. I agree. It's it's a really nice combo. And it also can maximize your use of money, you know, because yes. again, private lessons are more expensive and I I am extremely frugal. Anyone who knows me knows that. So, um Oh, you're beyond when, frugal. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> when a when a student will succeed in a group situation that is typically my first piece of advice for them because you can get more bang for your buck more training opportunities more experience more variety there's a huge advantage to that but if there's any reason to be concerned about any behavior then the the level of control that a trainer can provide in a one-on-one lesson is so invaluable that it's it really makes a huge difference and for many dogs having a single lesson or even you know, two or three before doing a group class can be really valuable. Absolutely. Now, there are, of course, dogs who are never going to be appropriate in group class. Right, and right. for those dogs, they still deserve training. They still, you know, they there is value um, in teaching them to be safe and happy in their home in a situation that isn't a distracting group class. And, and there's also problems that we can't recreate in group class that we can only work on in a home environment. Right. Well, I was also thinking, too, one of the, when you said that, I thought about a particular client whose dog he had taken when it was young to, not terribly young, but nine, nine months a year, maybe, to the dog park. And as he mm-hmm. was leaving, the dog was attacked by a big dog. Mm-hmm. And at that point, the dog's like, okay, I don't like other dogs because they are really unpredictable and they really, really make me uncomfortable. That was not a dog that I was going to throw into a group class because it would have just been putting him smack dab in the middle of what he considered to be, oh, something like hell on earth. Um, yeah. So we did a lot. Uh, we did some private training and we worked with uh fairly neutral dogs. At that time, I had my three dogs, Bingley, Hudson, and and Buckley. And my daughter, Emma, and her then boyfriend, Thomas, who's now her husband, um, we had, I was in the front yard with the owner and the dog. Now, this is like a third private lesson. We've already practiced a whole bunch of stuff. And they were a half a block away in our van, and they would take a dog out, walk in front of the van, go back and get back in the van. So it could really control the distance. Mm -hmm. And the reactivity, we had three neutral dogs. Till it got to the point where actually our dogs could parade, could walk right along the front of um, Oscar's front yard, and he would turn and check in with with, um, his owner. Mm -hmm. So that was really advantageous for me to be able to have neutral dogs that I could control the whole situation. Because one of the problems with group classes is you have a certain amount of control but you have a certain amount of uncontrolledness too. Absolutely. And I was not going to put that poor little dog who was terrified of dogs into a group class where he would completely either shut down or freak out. So yes. that was yet another situation where I think eventually he did come to class. If not, he came to my walking Granville class, which was very specific dogs that I knew how to handle. We did a lot of introductions and that kind of stuff. So it doesn't, necessarily mean that you have to go to a facility for a group class by walking Granville class. We meet in downtown Granville and in a little park and we start there and we walk. So there can be a lot of interesting options for you if your dog has a particular behavior problem, if you're willing to be open to a wide variety of solutions. And, and honestly, mm-hmm. if you have the money for a larger you know, variety of solutions. Um, but- right. Because because private lessons are very time intensive yes. for the owner and for the trainer that they add up in our time a lot too. It's particularly yes. if the trainer comes to your home because then we have to add in travel time and any time we spend taking notes or any of that stuff. It's always amazing to me how many how much time gets added onto it. One other thing that crossed my mind as you were talking about this is 
there is tremendous value in having some um, neutral dogs that we can yes. work and not every trainer has those dogs and some of the trainers who do have those dogs need to be very, well all trainers who have these dogs need to be very careful about how and when they use them mm -hmm. because it is not fair for a dog to have a lot of experiences where other dogs are always yelling at it, you know, right. like, oh, yay, I'm going to work with mom. And huh, <laughs> what that means that I'm going to have these barking, lunging lunatics scream at me. That sounds fun. Um, and I, I have seen some trainers use their dogs more than I would like. So I'm not talking about your dogs, Julie, specifically, because I know that you were really careful in using Emma and three dogs and rotating through. But I have seen trainers feel pressure from clients because the mm -hmm. client has a very serious need and they need to work with another dog. And the trainer's like, well, I could bring my dog. But in some cases, I have I have felt that dogs were used too often um, and that there was it was to their detriment at times. So one thing you need to know if you are a person who, who is looking for a trainer to help you with a reactive dog is that that trainer may need some of your friends and neighbors to help in some ways to supply dogs that we're going to be orchestrating at a different, at a distance so that we're having very few experiences for these dogs, right. as opposed to one dog having lots and lots and lots of, of fairly, you know, exciting days. Right. And and I also, too, knew which dog I could take where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was the other thing is, is not e not every one of my dogs was appropriate for every given situation. And it was also not appropriate if I didn't have an appropriate handler. Mm -hmm. One of the problems I have right now is I don't have um, another good handler. So when I want to take one of my dogs, I'm talking about either I'm handling my dog and shouting to the owner for mm -hmm. instructions right? Or um, I've got my dog like tethered to my car while I'm over with the, uh, with the owner. So it's not an ideal situation for me right now. And, um, and I do have to be a little bit more careful with the two dogs that I have because Bear is still young. He's only one. He just turned one, although he's about, he's huge. Anyway, um, and then Zuzu has her own special needs mm -hmm. um, with her own anxiety that, um, you know, it's, it's, I have to be very, very careful about when and how I use my dogs. So when we're looking at group versus private, some of the pros of private lessons are a real one-on-one -on -one focus with the trainer, being mm -hmm. able to address very specific contextual issues within your home. You know, what do I do at my doorway? We can practice at your doorway as opposed to yes. in class where we're <laughs> pretending. Now let's pretend we're at the door. Um, and and really tailoring the goals to what your goals are. Because in a class, I'm going to say we're all practicing stay and we're all shooting for 30 seconds. And your dog is a rock star stay and can do a 10 minute stay. But the other dogs in class, we need to work on 30 seconds. So we're, we're playing with variables. So we could move forward right. quicker versus slower, depending on what your dog needs. Those are some of the, the big advantages I see for privates. What are some of the other advantages you see for privates? I was going to say, too, for me, sometimes it's really advantageous just to see the layout of the house. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes when I'm talking about it, I'm like, oh, I get it. OK, so how can we manage space more effectively? Mm -hmm. um, that can be a really key thing because they're telling me this. The other thing I find, too, is that oftentimes it's, it's really interesting to see how the dog behaves in his home environment. Yes. Um, so that a dog in class may be behaving differently than a dog in a home environment. And so I find that let's talk about what we're dealing with. And the other thing I was just thinking about it, um, one client that I was so glad we did privates because of, of two particular things. One is they had a dog that lived behind them that would pace the fence mm -hmm. and rev their dog up. So we're talking about how do we manage the neighbor's dog? How do we, you know, it's just so saying, you know, I think it's fine if they want to to meet over the fence, but what kind of games can we play to keep your dog engaged with you in the yard? You know, keep an eye out for when the dog is not up. That would probably be a good time. So we could talk about how to effectively manage their backyard. The other thing they had were cats. And I kept looking around going, your cats need to go up. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think if your cats had a way to get higher we wouldn't be having some of the cat-dog issues that we have. 
And so indeed, they went out and, and fairly inexpensively were able to build in each in two corners places for the cats. And you know what? Their problems virtually went away mm-hmm. between the dogs and the cats. So really seeing the layout of the house and what and the other thing I find too is then if they have an objection to one of my suggestions, they can say, This is why this won't work here. Right. And we can we can start really working on that particular solution. Because if you're in class and you say, well, why don't you try this? And they're like, well, I don't think that would work. I can't envision right. why that wouldn't work. Yeah, it is interesting because our brains are sort of wired for story and detail. So when you, just now, when you were describing this family with the cats and going vertically, I got mental pictures in my head of a living room and where I put cat trees. It wasn't my living room. It was just a living room. Um, but what's interesting is when the when the client is describing something, we're, we're wired to make a picture, to create an image. Right. And so our advice is sort of based on this generic image and having the, the chance to actually go in and see the house and see the structure. It's amazing all the really specific and pretty simple strategies that you can suggest in these. And you're like, oh, if we just, <laughs> we had an appointment recently with, with, um, with two dogs and a baby and, um, Pam Nashman, the owner of All About Dogs, and I were there, and they're going to be fine, but we're standing in the living room kind of redecorating. We're like, your living room is beautiful. However, if we were going to make this better for your dogs, and just verbally kind of saying, well, I would slide the couch this way a little bit, and I'd move the crate over there, and then I would have this area for the kids, and you know, and like, would it be prettier? No, it would not. Will it work so much better and make your daily life easier? Yes, it would. So whether they do it or not remains, you know, that's their choice. But the fact is, it was so clear that if the crate could just be at the edge of the dining room, life was going to be better. That, you know, that was a real simple solution. But that's not something you'd ever say to somebody in a group class. Oh, put the crate in the dining room. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's kind of like, you know, I don't have a dining room. Well, then you should build one so you can put the crate in it because that's what I have found to be effective. Exactly. So, yeah, I find, and the other thing that I find too is that um, when I'm doing a private lesson and I'm at somebody's home, I have, I always, I mean, I, I have a certain, my initial consult with them is usually about an hour and a half it's longer because we go over a lot more Mm -hmm. things and then subsequent ones are somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. But I always book in my, in my schedule more time because what I've also found in private lessons is that I'm at somebody's home. They've offered me a cup of coffee. We're talking, we're chatting about the dog. We're doing a couple of things and then it starts to come out. Mm -hmm. That's when the issue really starts to come out and they feel comfortable, a little bit more comfortable because I don't want to talk about this in front of the group class because everybody else's dogs seem to be like really normal and mine's not. And so that private setting Mm -hmm. allows for a little bit more comfort and I don't want to say honesty, but perhaps gives them the ability to reveal a little bit more because it's in the privacy of their home, openness. And I find that if we're, especially if we're dealing with behavior issues Mm -hmm. is incredibly important. I really do need to know if this dog has bitten your neighbor. Mm -hmm. I really do need to know how serious that bite was. And you may not want to talk about that in public, but in your home, we can really chat about, yeah, there was there was that bite, and then there was this bite, and then, you know, I remember when he growled, <laughs> and all these things start to come out, and that is, that is another real key, I think, is that it provides the client with a safe place to talk about serious issues. Mm-hmm. And then if we need to, like, for example, yesterday I was with a client, and they don't have any serious issues, they have two adorable puppies. Um, but they wanted to talk about stuff. So when I got there, the puppies were in their crates in another room working on Kongs so that we could sit down and talk. And that's another advantage to a private lesson is that we can have the dog settle down. So if we need to talk about something 
And in a group lesson, that's much harder. Mm -hmm. So um, there are some real, um, I would say, perhaps more subtle things that make private lessons perhaps uh, more effective for some people. And I've also found, too, I worked with one young woman, very sweet girl. She had her own anxiety disorder, and she got the dog because she thought perhaps a dog would help her find a way into meeting people because they, she could meet through her dog. Mm -hmm. But she really wanted to do the lesson. She didn't want to do it in a group class because that was too many people and too many dogs. Mm -hmm. So we did some private lessons to get her started, and then we talked about strategies about how she could talk to people about her dog. And if her dog was doing this, that would be an opening for her to talk to them about that. And so um, I, I thought it was incredibly brave of her to face her anxiety mm -hmm. and to try and find a creative solution, but to also recognize that before I can fully implement that, I have to work within my comfort zone to get my yes. dog trained. So that's another reason that it could be that I'm just not comfortable in a group. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll get there. I, I might be more comfortable in a group once my dog's a little bit more trained and I'm a little bit more confident, then we can move into a group class. And so now what you're working on is a dog that may have attention issues or you may have some anxiety issues, but everybody has the behaviors down. So we're not trying to both learn behavior and right. work on being comfortable in class. So group lessons after privates are a great way to take a dog who may be a reactive or excitable dog. He has the skills, so we're not trying to learn all kinds of new things at one time. We have the skills. We're now just trying to do those skills in front of other dogs. Mm -hmm. so. so basically it comes down to that there are a lot of variables on whether or there not are. group class or private lessons are right for you and your dog. And the variables are about both of you. They're about how your dog handles things and how you handle things, what the goals are that you want your dog to learn, and and what the best environment is for helping you get those skills. So it's not it's not a straight, um, you know, if this then that kind of answer. But a good trainer should be able to probably even on their website help you figure out most of the yes. answers to this you know just in the in their descriptions of their programs you should be able to tell whether you think your dog might do better in a group class or a private lesson and then if you need to you can contact the trainer and and get more information about that to see what's right for you and your dog right um i agree and then then i oftentimes have that conversation People will call and say, what do you think is appropriate? And well, well, you know, what do we want to do? Are we are we training towards a specific goal? Or, you know, if you have, you know, a nine month old um, golden retriever who has no issues, except that we need to be trained. Well, group class is a great way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not talking about any particular issues like separation anxiety or resource guarding or, you know, something that really you can address in a group class then that would probably be my, my, first, um, my first suggestion. But there are a lot of reasons to do a private lesson, not just for your dog, personally. You know, where you, where is your comfort zone? It's not just where your dog's comfort zone is. It's where your comfort zone is. And I think that's an important thing to consider. And any good trainer is hopefully going to be able to read both of those things. Because I think it's really important that dog trainers are not just there for trainers, for not just there for the dogs. Yeah. Trainers are there for the people, too. Yeah, well, I don't know that that's all entirely true for many of them, but... No, I don't think it is we'll either. just go with your little fantasy that it is. And the other thing, when you're saying about people call and ask you, and I'm like, oh, there are so many trainers who are like, please, God, don't call me. No, I just assume, you know, that's one reason why you can't sign up for classes on my website. You have to call me. Because I want yeah. to talk to you because I want to help you try and figure out what's best for you and your dog. Because one thing I learned, um, and I, I learned this when I was at All About Dogs, I learned it very early on and it's been my guiding principle ever since. And that is you have to have a hierarchy of being and that people have to come first. So when I'm dealing with, with, a dog. I'm not dealing just with a dog. I'm dealing with a unit of a, at least a dog and a person. And that if mm -hmm. I make people my priority and the welfare of the people have to come first, then I usually do, I would say 99% of the time I'm doing right by the dog as well. 
Um, and if I didn't have that hierarchy of being, I don't think that I would be nearly as effective as a trainer because I would be too much focused on the welfare of the dog and not the unit of the dog and the person. And I got to take care of the family first. Okay, so I think we've pretty well covered it for privates birth as group training and not really given a whole lot of insight as to which is right for your dog, except to say that, yes, training is right for your dog. And training if, is right for your dog. And if you work with a good trainer, she or he will be able to help you decide what's the best course of action for your budget, for your dog, and for you. Okay. Yes. So when we did the podcast, I don't remember the number on it, but we will make a link to it in the website about the monthly health checkup, which was a series of questions where you just answered. If you answered yes to all of them, then your dog was healthy. So Colleen and I made a pledge that we were going to do our monthly health checkups with our dogs. And I think it was probably broadcast, what, about three, four months ago now? I think it's about that long, yeah. So the question is, we, we promised we would check in with each other as to whether or not we stayed on top of this. So the question on the table now, Colleen, is have you been doing your monthly health checkup with Edzo? I have. And actually, I've, I've loved the, um, the check sheet which I had not used before before you brought it to the podcast. So I've appreciated that. Um, it, mine's, mine's in bullet points, not numbers. So I don't okay. know exactly how many questions it is, but it's not that many. Um, and it's a true-false. Right. But what's interesting to me are my dog is at least 12 and a half. I've had him 10 and a half years, and he was probably two or three when we got him. So he is an older dog and I'm in complete denial about that. I am only allowing him to be two years old in my head. So okay, fair to enough. Have this monthly health <laughs> check is good because what I'm finding are there are questions that I can't answer true or false to. Oh, so that's interesting. For these I'm adding a little bit of information. So I go through the list and I'm like, true, 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 true kind of sort of baby true ish um, <laughs> and so it's not false per se but it's not true either so for example i did this on the i did it yesterday okay um and has a normal appetite and hasn't lost or gained much weight true or false and i have true ish <laughs> His appetite seems pretty good. However, I think he may be eating something in the yard. Several mornings, he's not wanted to eat his breakfast or his calm. On some occasions, he has eaten it very slowly. On others, he's walked away from the bowl. This has happened more in the past month. And I had noted specifically three days when he turned up his nose at breakfast. Three days in his entire life, and they all happened in the last month. That's probably relevant, you know? This right. is a dog who loves breakfast. Um, so... Having this monthly check has been helpful for that because this is a small thing, but this is the kind of thing that the vet will ask you about. Right. And it's easy to forget. And you're like, well, I don't, I, I guess he's mostly kind of, sort of, but by looking at it monthly, do I think this is the same as previous or not? It, it, that's been helpful to me. How about for you? Have you been using it? Um, well, not as well as you have. Um, I have not been making notes. I probably have done it instead of monthly, probably more like six weeks, to be honest. Um, I think I've done it two times since we talked. So that would be about every six weeks or so. Um, it's not, I, 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 my excuse is my dogs are younger. My yeah, dogs, dogs are younger. Yeah. Uh, Zuzu's two and a half and Bear is just one. So um, I'm not feeling the same sort of pressure as I would if my dogs were older because, um, you know, I've kind of been keeping an eye on it. But it's probably a good thing. On the other hand, this is the time to do it on a monthly basis. So I get a baseline of behaviors and a baseline of health. So I can compare that. You know, this is this is what we've been doing. Yes, we've been fine. Every month we've checked in okay. Then I have a great baseline of behavior so that when the month is off, I can say, wait a minute, this is not the way it is. So even though my dogs are younger and I haven't felt as much of a need to do it, I still think that um, 
it is a good thing to do and something I should try and do more like every four weeks rather than every six weeks. Because mm-hmm. six can easily slide into seven. And if I try and keep it, cl- it closer, does. keep it closer to four, then I'm working on four to five rather than six to seven. And that makes a bigger mm-hmm. difference. That's almost a two month difference. What I would also ask you too, Colleen, is have you done um, Dr. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Our friend from Tufts. Karis. Karis. Dr. Karis. Have you been using her health checklist at all? I haven't. I was thinking about that. And what I think is sort of the same reasoning that you've just used with your dogs is that there's not a problem at the moment. Like the comfort diary. I think that these monthly checks are quick and easy and really simple for me to do until I have something specific that I want to be tracking. And then the and comfort then when diary. when I want to be tracking, I'm totally going to pull out that comfort diary and have that okay. because that provides a different quality assessment of life. Right. It is also on a daily basis as opposed to a monthly basis. Yes. So, yes, yes I think. So I think that they're very supplemental kinds of things. And yeah, I think they're great. I do, too. So. All right. So I'm glad that you have been doing and I'm glad that Ezra was doing as well as he is. And you have inspired me to now put it on my calendar on a specific day. Like I had the first and the 15th on my calendar to clean Zuzu's ears. So how much harder would it be on one of those days to also do right. the health check? So I have an online journal app, day one app that I do a a daily entry of just the boring stuff that happens in my life each day, but it has a reminder feature. So I have it set up with a reminder feature and I can get it to pre-fill the the chart and I just have to go through and delete the falses for the things that are not true. Yeah, or for the things that, you know what I'm trying to say here. I can delete the T or the F. Um, (laughs) So it's totally simple. And it just pops up and I do it. And it turns out we talked about this in September. We recorded an episode in September. Ah. I just looked and we have been doing it um, since then. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, So now I really feel bad because I think I've only maybe done it twice since then and I should have done it more often. So I would love it if you would send me a link to your online journal thing. And maybe we can put that on the website too for anybody else who wants to do it. It's called the Day One app. The day and one app. I love it. I've been using it for a couple of years and I it works with my computer and my phone and they sync to each other. So I can put a note in my phone and, you know, look at my computer a second later and there it is. And you can add photos, which is awfully nice too. So which is great for the monthly health check. I have not been good about adding a photo each time. Okay. I do think I should put a photo each time because again, you don't notice your dog getting grayer. You don't notice right. they start leaning a little to the left, that kind of stuff. And I, some of mine have photos. Some of them don't. Right. Well, I also, I, my, in, in my, also my defense that my dogs are not as old, um, <laughs> I would say one of the things that I do is I spend so much time watching dogs and watching my dogs that I notice things. Like the other day when we were out and it was like sub-zero, it wasn't quite sub-zero, but it was very cold. And I looked over and I went, you just limped. And I'm like, Brad, did you see that? And he goes, see what? I said, Zuzu, she's limping. And he's like, she's what? And I, said, I swear, she's limping. So I noticed little things like that. Well, it turns out that we had ice in our pads and I figured that was probably it. But so my excuse is that I watch my dogs um, apparently obsessively. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Depending on who in your household you ask. The limping just reminds me, though, I'm going to share one more note from, from yesterday's journal because one of the questions is moves and walks easily without stiffness or pain. And I wanted to say true, but my note says, T, with the exception of a few weird moments outside. We had a little snow recently, and I think, hope, the iciness was playing a role in this. On a walk with Kyle, who's my middle son, and on two morning walks with me, Edzo's gait has abruptly changed. I've never seen anything like it, and I'm not sure how to describe it. It's almost as if he's rolling his spine forward in a curve, sort of a spiral forward movement. He appears to favor a hind leg. Today it seemed to be the right hind leg, but I'm not sure if it was the same yesterday. (laughs) He's distinctly off balance and pitching forward. It lasted about eight steps, and then he walked normally again. On each of these walks, it happened more than once. I've not seen anything like this inside. He's continued to be interested in sniffing and the walk itself. So there was like, well, is it true or is it false? Well, it's 
mostly true, except for that he was a little weird. My dog was weird. But having the ability to just sort of add a note in there. Right. And it was snow. You know, it had to be snow within his pads. But I will say that he walked weirder than any dog I've seen. I was like, oh, what is that? Right. <laughs> right. Um, well, yeah, and, and like Zuzu, when I took her cross-country skiing with me, and there was a little section, and I was on the lake, and I was at this narrow cottage, I was because the road was still a little gravelly. And along the edge, she got her, she she put her paws in a puddle, and there was a little part of the ice near the shore that had broken through. And then she jumped in the snow. And it was like 17 degrees. So mm-hmm. she's got these wet paws that she's now put in the snow, and then, so we finished the ski and she didn't want to come inside. And I'm like, Mm-mm, you have to come inside because I know for a fact you have ice. If you've got ice on your chin and on your neck, you have ice chunks in those pads and you're coming inside and we're going to thaw those out. So I think that probably has something to do with her gait. But I also, um, just as a reminder, is that these are also, these, these true or false things are also ways to keep you just attuned to your dog Mm -hmm. and if you notice something like that and there's a reasonable explanation such as you put your paw into a puddle and then you jumped in the ice and snow (laughs) then i'm going to keep an eye on you to make sure that that you haven't done any damage to your paw with that ice but that's a reasonable explanation for a funny gate but if the funny gate continues after that now you at least you have a starting point saying, okay, maybe something else happened here. Maybe we slipped on the ice with our icy paws and strained our leg or something. So you know whether or not you should um, move forward and, and see your vet. But it's also great because then you have that information. So mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah. So I recommend that people do this, if not monthly, at least a couple of times a year. Yes. I think even for young dogs, a quarterly health check. And and it should take you a minute. I mean, literally yes. one minute. Is my dog acting normally in good spirits? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just true, 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 all the way down the list. Right. And that's a good thing for you to have. All right. So since I have young dogs and I did on a, I'm basically on a quarterly basis, so then I'm okay. You're perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone knows you're perfect, Julie. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, everyone except those who live in this household with me. But uh, well, somebody forgot to tell them. That... I'll be happy to tell them. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds great. <laughs> All right, so we have talked about private versus group lessons, which I think we covered pretty well. Check with your trainer. Talk to her in detail about what's right for you. And, um, you know, pay attention to your dog. Pay attention to little changes. And if you can, just make a quick note on your calendar if you notice something odd. So that when you co- when the vet asks, has your dog ever done? You can say, yeah, it's right here on my calendar. So, mm-hmm. all right. Well, thanks, Colleen. That was a great deal of fun. And um, we will see you all next time. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Colleen and Julie would love to hear them. Call 614-349-1661 or visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts. I had a client say to me that they were driving to New York and she suggested to her husband to listen to one of Julie's podcasts. So they turned on Your Family Dog and I don't remember which one they started with, but they really enjoyed it. And they ended up listening to a whole series of them on the way to New York. And she said, we so enjoyed it. And my husband's like, this is really good. This is really interesting. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend about it. We'd love to reach people who feel as we do, that life is better with a dog.